أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العلم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وارزقنا فهما وحفظ المرسلين اللهم افتح إلينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصلي اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله the section inshallah we'll be doing today is uh, is entitled thalathatu ashya tubna alayha sa'ada the three things upon which sound contentment and felicity is built in other words the three things that are required to maintain a psychological harmony uh, within yourself Um, I don't know. I think the sound is okay. Saif said it's okay. It's okay for me. Um, is anyone else having an issue? Sound is a low. I'll check on my end. Okay. All right, so let, let's continue, inshallah. If there's any issue, we'll try and rectify it yeah, as it comes up. So the, the three things upon which sound harmony is built, sound psychological states are built within you, three major components. And what happens when either of these components is out of proper place? What is the result of it? Now, in order to really understand this, um, before we do the section itself, I'm going to walk you through the, the concept of it from a macro cosmological scale into the micro individual scale. So just bear with me because to understand this, see, Azali has, he's not giving you all the details here. Kina Saada is a, is a, is an abridgment, a summarization of the Ihya Ulumuddin in which you will find more details. So I'm going to try and walk you through the, the, these concepts um, because as you see in the previous section, he gave you this allegory and the allegory is a universal allegory. It's an allegory of governance, which if you look in the fitrah of, of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything, it, it, it can apply on all those levels. Right? As Allah says, Fitrat Allah, Alati Fataran Nasa Aleha. This is the, the nature with which Allah has, has originated everything. And, and thus it is also the same nature uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has originated the human being. And He says, La tabdila li khalqillah. There's no change in the creation of Allah. In other words, this is how he has set everything. And the human being is a cosmological reflection, has a cosmological reflection within him. So the, the, there are four concepts that I will highlight for you. There, there are many other concepts, but four primary concepts that, that you really need to understand as underlying the creation of the cosmos and everything that is within the cosmos. You'll find these in my book, The One-Eyed Imposter, chapter two, I believe, uh, The Test of Life in time and, time, time and Dimensionality. And in that section, I argue within the context of the book, the kind of trials that the Dajjal and the Dajjalic age will subject to mankind insofar as these four concepts are concerned, because these are the biggest trials within the human being. The first of these is Tawheed. It is the, the, the unity of the one and the true and the absolute. 
everything else in creation is relative to him. So you've got two things. You've got things that are absolute, and then you've got things that are relative. And then you've got things that are absolute in a defined state and things that are absolute in an indefinite state. And insofar as things that are relative, things that are relative are based, their, their placement in the world is based on their relation to other things. That's why it's called relative. So I'll give you an example of an absolute defined state. My relationship to my father is an absolute relationship. It's not a relative relationship. That relationship cannot change. Whatever the circumstance, whatever other position he takes or I take, that relationship will never change. He is my father and I am his son. You see? Now, my relationship to my cousin, that can change. Because say my cousin gets married to my brother. She's no longer my cousin. She's now my sister-in-law. So the relationship has changed. And this is why these are called relatives. Because they are relative to you. And you are a relative to them. Your position will change based on their position. And their position will change based on your position. So that's the relationship now between things that are absolute and things that are relative. When it comes to the cosmos, you've got three fundamental entities in the construction of the cosmos. You've got time, you've got space, and then you've got matter. So, for example, in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, that's your component of time. God created the heavens, there's your space, and the earth, and there's your matter, the material. So these three components had to be in place for the creation of the cosmos. You have to have all three. Because if you had space and matter, but no time, when would you, when would you manifest it? When would it take place? If you had space and time, but no matter, what would you put there? And if you had time and matter, but no space, where would you put it? So all three had to be there, and they had to be there at the point of creation. Now, out of these three, two of them are relative. One is absolute. I defined absolution, as in it's absolute in a defined state. Because all three cannot be relative. And this is the argument of the modern world, that everything is relative. Time is relative, because this is where you get all the general theory of relativity and such and such. And it's a matter of terminology because the theory is sound if you replace the word time with something else. What they perceive as time being relative is not actually time being relative. It's events that are occurring in time that is relative. Because I mentioned this last week, I believe, that we measure time based on events that are taking place. You see the sun moving, that's an event. And then we mark that event and then we build the count from there. That event itself is not time. That's just an event that is occurring in time. Our argument from an Islamic perspective is to say that time is not the relative quantity, the, the relative entity here. What's relative is space and matter. Because matter can change. It can become bigger or smaller. It can become heavier or lighter. The density can change. The mass can change. The configuration can change. The state of matter can change from a solid to liquid. And because it is subject to change, it is relative, just like my cousin is subject to change in her relationship with me. We cannot say we, we have that. So, so, so Earth, we have established that the Ard, which is the material, is relative. Matter is a relative entity. Space is also a relative entity because matter occupies space. Whenever matter changes, space will change. If an object changes its size, it will displace the space. So if we have this room and then we inflate a huge balloon, before we do that, the room is empty, the space is empty, okay? Then we inflate this balloon and it fills up the whole room. Now the space is filled up. So the material, the matter has changed and the space has also changed. So the third component in this case has to be absolute. It cannot change. 
because in the equation, you have to have two variables and a constant, right? This is very crucial. There's a reason why I'm bringing this up, so just bear with me. Because when it comes to now understanding the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to understand that there are things in this world that have an absoluteness, meaning there's a defined absoluteness to them. And they have a relation to other things. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has neither of those. And there is no word to describe that. We use the closest to say that he is the only real and the only true absolute. He's not changing in that sense. He doesn't change his form and shape and all those things. He doesn't occupy space. He's not subjected to time. This is important to understand because when it comes to reflecting from within the issues and trials and tribulations that an individual faces, those issues and trials and tribulations are relative. He is the one who is absolute. And so if anyone can rectify that, it's him. That's now, that's one piece. Then comes the concept of ilm, of knowledge. Because everything in this creation is in a state of knowing. Everything is in a state of knowing. Because in every unfolding moment, God is revealing himself to creation. In every unfolding moment, he is revealing himself to creation. And in order for you to understand that, you have to know that. And this is why he has created the alam and given the human being an ability to learn from the alam, to gain a knowledge from the alam. Because through that knowing, he can then come to understand as God is revealing himself to his creation. The third component then comes in, and this is the component of governance, of khilafa not in the state political mundane sense, in the cosmological sense. Everything in creation is in a state of either governing or being governed. Either this thing is governing or is being governed. Means there are a set of laws and ordinances that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in place for all of creation to follow, willingly or unwillingly by choice or without choice. This is again reflected in the internal. That's the allegory that Ghazali gave. The Ghazali's allegory is a universal allegory. Sound governance, that's the hierarchy, that's how it functions. Then comes the fourth piece now, and the fourth piece is our focus today. And this is the concept of balance, tawazun, concept of balance. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created is in a state of balance. How does this balance work? It is not one dimensional. It's got multiple dimensions. There is a balance insofar as matter is concerned, material balance. There is a balance insofar as material is concerned. So let's, if you look in, in the social sense, some people have wealth, others don't have wealth. If you combine the two, it evens out. So in Islam, you give zakat, those who have give zakat to enable those who don't have so that the balance is restored or the imbalance in wealth is eradicated, right? Then there is a spatial balance in terms of space. Some places are in one state, another place will be in a different state. So you have a rainforest here, you have a desert over here. You've got water there, you've got land here. You see, that's as far as material, that's as far as space is concerned. Then you've got a balance that's temporal, a balance in time. Now, it is important for us who are studying this, and important likewise for the human beings to understand this. I mean, it's not something that people understand that quickly. That the balance, when you put your faith now in Allah, because you are relative and everything he subjects you to, the trials and tribulations are relative, which means only he can resolve for you because he is absolute. When he subjects this to you, it is important for you to understand that 
if the balance is to be restored, he will restore it materially, spatially, and temporally in terms of time. It's not just material compensation or spatial compensation or uh, compensation in time, because this is the component that everyone misses out on, the time component. You see, somebody does an injustice to you, and yes, it is an injustice to you. The other person is the oppressor, the tyrant. You are the one who needs to be compensated, but you are hasty about it. You want justice now. You want how much was taken from you to be given back to you right now. You see, here in this space right now. But that's not the sunnah with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals. Because the reason why he subjects you to trial is so that it can purify you from within. That's what fitna is. Fitna is that which tests for impurity. So there's an impurity in you and he is testing you or testing that impurity in you so that you can realize that impurity within you and rectify it. And the reason why he will not give you compensation immediately, what the Hindus like to call karma, right? The Hindus have this concept of karma, immediate recompensation. Sometimes it will happen immediately. Sometimes it won't. The reason why it won't happen immediately is because he's giving you space now. He's giving you space in time to reflect on it. Because he's not going to change your condition until you change your own condition. He's not going to help you until you help yourself. Because you cannot change the behavior of other people. They have to change themselves. And he's not going to intervene unless you make the effort to change. When you realize what is it within you, even if the other person has committed this act on you and, 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 you, and he is at fault, what is it that is within you that is being tested? And the most profound example you can see is the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Because the impurity that is being tested is, is tested against the forbearance of the individual. You see, we ultimately say that your faith is being tested. Allah is testing your Iman, right? But it, it breaks down. It's more sophisticated. That's just a general statement. Your Iman is being tested. Yes, what part of the Iman. How is it being tested? Which component is being tested? You see, forbearance is one of the things that's, that is tested most. And the Prophet ﷺ was the most forbearing of all, all, all mankind. I mean, look at what transpired when he went to Taif, right? What happened in Taif? I, he already had, he was already in a bad state. His own people were not listening to him. And he was trying now, okay, let's try somewhere else to, to call people to Islam. And then what did they do? The beating, the abuse, you know, complete injustice. Injustice to such a degree that even the heavens were angered about it. Jibreel was there. He already came to the Prophet wasallam. You know, give the word. There's an angel behind the mountain. Give the word. He's going to bring the mountain down on the, on the whole city. But what did the Prophet do? Huh? What did the Prophet do? Who, who came to him in that moment? Who came to him in that moment? The, the, the slave from Nineveh. And who was sent to Nineveh? Yunus alayhi salam. And, and this, is, this is what, when we talked about memory last week, we spoke about priming, right? The, the priming is what triggers a memory of something else. And, and in the Quran, you see all these stories have been sent out. Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi says, when he gives his thema of the Quran, one of the themes is al-Qasas, the stories. He says that one of the reasons that these stories have been put there is to give the Prophet Sallallahu a reminder, primarily him and then to others as well, that don't be disheartened. See what happened to your brother Yunus. See what happened to your brother Musa. See what happened to Nuh. 
See, you don't be disheartened. You are part of a long tradition. You see? And so here comes this slave who he's sitting there resting his head and this slave comes in and reminds him of what happened to Yunus. And, and now there's a reflection that's taking place. And he, and he, he changes, he, says, he tells Jibril no. Because, and he makes the dua that yeah, they didn't, understand, they didn't want to accept it, but their children, you know, let the message reach their children so that they can come around to Islam. And he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, where are you going to send me next? To, to some other hostile people who will beat me and abuse me? Where are you going to send me next? In lam yakun bika ghadbun alayya fala 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 ubali you know as long as you're happy with me it, it doesn't matter where you send me as long as you're pleased with me I mean, that's, that's the moment of reflection. I mean, regardless of what has just transpired, as long as you're happy with me, wherever you send me, whatever you put in my path, I accept. I, we are a kind of people nowadays, somebody pinches you and you start jumping up and down like a monkey. Oh, he did this to me. Oh, he did that to me. Oh, what is it? I'm sending you the petition. Send that one in the WhatsApp. Do like this. Call that other one. This is, this is us. When fitna takes place, when we are subjected to trial, nobody thinks that the moment has to pass. Allah is giving you time. He's not going to give you recompense right now. He wants to see your endurance. Who is the best in that moment? Who is going to show what his beloved could show with all that sincerity? This is, this is the thing. This is what I want you now to focus on as, you are, as we go through this section. Because the trial comes in. It affects you. It puts you in a state of imbalance. That's the moment when you need to reflect. It's not the moment to react. It's not the moment to demand justice, even if you're not at fault. It's the moment to react. I mean, it's the moment to reflect. Because I can guarantee you, whatever the circumstance, Whatever the circumstance, wherever you are, whoever is doing whatever to you, your fault is in that circumstance as well because you played a part. You played a part. You're involved in the circumstance. You're involved in what's happening, which means you're playing a part in that. The only variance here is that when the scales are balanced, the other person is at fault, at greater fault, but you still have a part to play. You need to reflect on that part to see where exactly do you stand insofar as this trial that you've been subjected to is concerned. What impurity has it revealed about you? And until you rectify that, don't expect any assistance from your Lord because he will only guide you if you are willing to accept his guidance. And that's his guidance. He has come to you. He's given you this so that he can guide you. So, so let's, let's go through the section we show. <clears throat> Bismillah. So he says, Abu Hamid al Ghazali says, Tamam, tamam sa'ada mabni ala thalathati ashia. Complete felicity, all of all, all complete contentment, sound balance internally is built upon three things. Kuwa al ghadab, kuwa al shahwa, kuwa al al. The irascible faculty, the concupiscent faculty, the irascible faculty, and the faculty of knowledge, of ilm. Now, he, he doesn't mean ilm here in terms of book knowledge. He means ilm here in terms of the conversion from the intellect to the heart, not from the senses to the intellect. Remember, we spoke about this, uh, the, the intellect is in the middle position, 
there's a conversion that takes place on this side when you're learning, when you're reading, when you're listening, when you're seeing, observing. That conversion is from the external into the intellect. Then there is the conversion that takes place from the intellect to the heart. He's talking about that portion now, true intellection. So these three powers, the irascible, the concupiscent, and the intellection, the power of intellection. It is very important that these things, these ones, these three entities are kept in a balance. There has to be a balance because if any of them is off balance, it's going to create turmoil internally. If the power of concupiscence increases, your desire is out of control, your lust is out of control, it is going to manifest a disease of miserliness um, within you and you will be destroyed. Now, the, the disease that manifests in the heart, um, Fakhruddin al-Razi gives um, a very good explanation in, in, the, in his tafsir of, of the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. Fi qulubihim maradun fazadahum allahu maradun. He says that, so they have a diseased heart, there's a disease in their heart, and Allah prolongs the disease. Fakhruddin al-Razi says that as a concept, as a principle, uh, the, 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 the manifestation of a thing is its quality. Whatever, whatever a thing manifests in reality, that manifestation is its quality. So if a cup holds liquid, then that is the quality of the cup, right? If the cup is leaking, then its quality is depleted. It's not, it's, its quality is, 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 is less, is lessened in value because it's leaking, it's cracked, it's broken. So the, the manifestation of the heart is in two things. It's in belief and in knowledge, Iman and Alm. And so anything that affects that manifestation becomes a disease. Whatever affects the quality of a thing, that is its disease. So if the cup is cracked, the crack is affecting the quality of the cup in holding water. That crack is a disease. It needs to be rectified. Now, what's a disease in the English um, etymology? The, the, the word disease is actually two words. We, we've done this over time. You know, there's a theory in linguistics where the one of the reasons why English is becoming a, a deficient language is because words have been merged and their original etymologies have been forgotten. Disease is a word that has actually got two words. It has, a, it has an affix, a negative affix to the beginning of the word ease. So it's dis-ease. So you're in a state of ease means you're in a state of soundness. You're in a state of balance. means the thing is doing or is functioning as it's supposed to function. A dis-ease is what, is what is disrupts the ease. So when you're ill, it disrupts your normal functionality. So a disease is that which disrupts or affects the quality of an object in what it manifests. So a disease of the heart affects or disrupts iman or ilm or both. Because al-imanu bidun al-ilm jahlan. The two always go together. Faith without knowledge is ignorance. And knowledge without faith is heedlessness. So you've got ghafla and you've got jahl, jahla. You see, the, the two worst categories you could possibly be. So the disease of the heart will affect those two entities. So arrogance is a disease of the heart. Or it's rather arrogance is a manifestation of pride. Pride is a disease of the heart. Envy is a disease of the heart. And those are the things that you want to arrive at. In your psychological reflection now, the moment has happened, the tribulation has taken place. You need to think back now. What did I do wrong? You want to arrive at that end destination. What's the disease? What's the root cause? You see? And a lot of people, the self prevents them from going inward. 
The self will prevent them from going inward to look into the heart, what it is that caused them this distress, what their role was, what their fault was. Because, you know, people will actually admit to committing murder quicker than they will admit to having envy. <laughs> people will sooner admit to murder than, than admit to ha having envy. <laughs> you know, Audhu Billah, me, envy him. You know? <laughs> I, I know my audience doesn't like laughing. I don't know why. Are my jokes that bad? <laughs> you have my permission to laugh if that's the case. I, even those who are, who are on the Zoom, you can, you can unmute and laugh. So, you know, I feel like my joke had an effect. <laughs> anyway. So, it is important that these remain in a balance in their, in their affair, in the issuance, in the command, in, in what prompts these things to come, to become active. So, an external factor will come in and prompt the ghadab to become active or the shahwa to become active, right? So, like going back to the first, the second chapter, um, Where is it? When he said, Let's just do a quick recap on that so that we can move on from this one. He said, الذي هو اليد والرجل والرأس والجثة ولا تعرف ما في بطنك من الأمر So if you don't know yourself how do you expect to know your Lord and you say that I know myself but you don't know yourself you just know your hands and your legs and your feet and your head and your torso your dislikes and your dislikes I like coffee I don't like this thing I like that thing you know I enjoy music I enjoy movies these are all your outward manifestation. It's not your inward reality. You don't know your inward reality insofar as when the command is issued from internal, you know, the affair that has been prompted within you. Like, uh, you get angry and you want to argue. You want to debate. You want to, you want to fight back. You want to defend. Or when you're hungry, you want to eat. Or when you're thirsty, you want to drink. That's, that's the command. Where is it coming from? Now, that command is what he's referring to here. The, the, the issuances of these three faculties has to be balanced because the command needs to be there. You can't suppress it completely. You can't kill it off. You need them. You need these three faculties in order to maintain sound uh, psychological states. فَإِذَا تَوَسَّتَتِ الْقُوَّتَانِ Oh, sorry. أَوْ تَزِيدَ قُوَّ الْغَدَبِ فَتُخْرِجُهُ إِلَى الْجُمُوحِ فَيَحْلِكِ So, لِأَلَّا تَزِيدَ قُوَّ الشَّهْوَى فَتُخْرِجُهُ إِلَى الْرَسِّ فَيَحْلِكِ If the power of concupiscence is overinflated, it's too much, it's increased, it is going to manifest miserliness as a disease now in the heart and you will be destroyed because until you rectify the disease, you are in a state of turmoil. You are in a state of negative energy until you rectify the disease. And that's rectification of the disease has got multiple uh, remedies that you have to apply. Tawbah is one of those. And then ibadah to rectify is another thing. And then the good deeds, the Prophet Sallallahu said, good deeds will rectify your bad deeds. And then also, you know, now trying to do the opposite of what that disease is manifested in you. So like, in the past, you could go to somebody who is a spiritual healer and say, you know, I'm having this, this problem and, it, you know, I don't know what to do. It's causing me distress. The healer might say, oh, go and give sadaqah. Even though the two might be unrelated, completely unrelated. He, like, he might be saying, I'm having trouble finding a wife. Is, is there something wrong with me? Is something wrong with my face or whatever? Is something wrong with me? He'll say, go and give sadaqah. Like, what does that have to do with this? Well, it turns out, He's not, having, he's not able to find someone 
because he keeps demonstrating this, you know, me, myself, and I attitude, my silliness. And that's why he's the other person. And people are not dumb. They're not stupid. They can read these things. You see? So that's the healer will tell him, go and give sadaqa. Why? To break the disease of my silliness. And to do it constantly until the disease is completely eradicated. And how do you know that the disease is eradicated? You will see it in your dreams. Your dreams will change. Inshallah, we'll come to the section on dreams. I'm not going to get into that right now. We'll come to section on dreams and you'll understand how that works. Or your kual hadab, your irascible power is, is increased and that subjects you to, uh, to a state, to, 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 to an attitude of defiance. You become defiant now. You become arrogant. And that will also destroy you. فَإِذَا تَوَسَّتَتِ الْقُوَّةً بِإِشَارَةِ قُوَّةِ الْعُلْمِ دَلَّ عَلَى طَرِيقَ الْحِدَايَةِ If you balance these two faculties by the indication of the power of intellection, then this will lead you to the path of guidance. The only way to balance these two aspects is to involve the power of intellection. To put your administration and your defense force under the command of the, of the Grand Vizier. So if there is a circumstance, hold yourself, take a step back and think it through before you act. Whether it is in defense, it is in argumentation, someone said something to you, something has happened, hold yourself back. Because we all go through this, even the saintest of the saintest people. You know, the Grand Mufti of Constantinople would go through this. <laughs> Everyone goes through moments like this. You see, you need to hold it in that moment and think it through. There has to be a way to resolve that without conflict. There has to be a way of resolving that without indulgence. Whatever it is, hold and give your intellect a, a, bit, a chance Give it a moment to figure out what needs to be done. And he's not just talking about intellect in this case. He's talking about intellection. He's, he's referring to ilm. The more knowledge you have, the better your chance and ability to figure out what you need to do. Because knowledge endows you with wisdom. Imam Ali said knowledge endows you with wisdom. Wisdom is how you execute the knowledge. You may have the knowledge but not know how to execute it. Because you're not actually intellecting. Your intellect is not being given a chance by yourself to execute its power. And likewise, if the irascible faculty, it increases, it will facilitate conflict and violence and hostility. Once the circumstance happens, if you don't regulate it in that moment and allow it to, to manifest, then it goes out of control. What we say in speech, oh, I lost my temper, I lost my cool. Yeah, the lost, it means that you were not in control. It's not an excuse. I lost my temper is not an excuse. It's actually a, a blame. But we use it as an excuse because that's the self-talking. If you allow the heart to speak, it will be a blame. You will be blaming yourself. You'll be blaming yourself. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have lost my temper. وَإِذَا نَقَصَ However now, when, if it is depleted, so if it is inflated, it's outward now, conflict, violence, hostility, argumentation, debate, refute this one, refute that one. Now, if it is depleted, if it is depleted, you will lose that passion and that zeal in deen and dunya. Your lack of motivation, that's the, that's the root there. Many people are, complain about this. I'm not motivated. I don't have the drive. We don't have the drive because your ghadab has been depleted. That's the, that's the root cause. You need to fix that. 
and trace it back to what's going on in your heart. Because the reason why it is depleted is because your intellect is not in its right place. And the reason why the intellect is not in its right place is because the heart is not in the right place. Meaning in terms of governance. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means in terms of your internal governance, you've not maintained, you've not built that hierarchy that we talked about. If it is balanced, the irascible faculty, if it is balanced, it will manifest patience. Now, it will manifest patience, bravery, and hikmah. Because hikmah is the opposite of foolhardiness. To have wisdom, a wise person, is the opposite of a fool, right? So executing something or doing something with wisdom is the opposite of doing something with foolhardiness. You see, fools rush in. The wise hold back. So when it is balanced, it will now manifest in this because this is its quality, its prime quality. This is where it gets to shine. Bravery and courage and drive and passion and wisdom in actions, in deen and in dunya. That's the hadam. When it is overly, we'll come to the diagram, inshallah, in a bit. When it is overly inflated, it's damage, carnage. When it is depleted, there's no drive. The person is down, completely depressed, no motivation to do anything, even in religious matters. But when it is balanced, you will find bravery and courage and these type of things. As for the shahwa, wakada shahwa, and likewise for the shahwa, ida zadat kanal fisq wal fujur. If it is inflated and increased, too excited, it is going to manifest profligacy and, and immorality. And this will lead you to fasad. That's the, in Surah Al-Baqarah, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he spoke about the Khalifa, that's what the angels highlighted, these two things, because that's the worst outcome now, the fasad and the sifak, right? So the hadab overly inflated is ultimately going to cause bloodshed through conflict and hostility. And the shahwa overly inflated is going to lead to profligacy and immorality. And the resultant will be corruption. So how, how does that corruption work? For example, corruption in the land, for instance, is because of overconsumption. You see, they keep, they keep uh, whatever, in, they, they keep uh, cutting down trees and forests and this and that and all these things to put up other things like shopping malls. And this is all desire. This is all shahwa. You know, they want all the, these things, uh, you know, the movie theaters and we want to have fun. We want a theme park and we want this and so that we can entertain ourselves. These are all qualities of the shahwa. What in naqasat, if it is depleted, it is going to be, it is going to lead to inability and lethargy. You're feeling lazy. You just don't want to do it. You know, I'm just down. Uh, inability to do something. Why? Because the appetite is to do it is not there. The desire to want to do is not there. I want to do it. You see, I want to learn. I want to know. And we spoke about knowledge as one of the components of uh, the, the concepts of the cosmos that underlies the cosmos. Aristotle begins his book on metaphysics by saying, all men, all men by their very nature desire to know. All men, all, all, and he, in the, in the traditional language, that includes women, by the way. This is not something, it's just language has changed, so this becomes a problem now. All men, yani all of humanity, by their very nature, desire to know. It's the desire to know. It's the shahwa that gives you that drive to want to know, to learn, to acquire, to go out and do things, you see? If it is depleted, then you are in a state of meh, don't feel like it. In tawassatat kan al iffa wal qana'a wa amthala dalik. If it is mediated, if it is balanced, it will lead to chastity and moderation. 
and other such examples. Abstinence. The, the biggest thing about the month of absin abstinence of fasting is regulation of the shahwa, chastity. You see, that's, that's the biggest challenge. If it is balanced, it will enable you to be moderate in your consumption. It will enable you to have enough drive and passion to do things. It's not going to lead you off balance to, to just now you lose it completely. Then the self takes, you see, that's the volition of the self now. These two are part of the self. The self will take over them. Let's, let's bring up the, the, the diagram and, and that will help uh, explain a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so go to the next one. We know this one, go next one. Yes, there we go. Now, so you can see that now, you have your concupiscence, your irascibility, and your intelligence, your aql, your ghadab, your shahwa. Now, and then down below, you've got the pig, the dog, the demon. Um, in the, not in this section, inshallah, in the section after that, Yes, he's going to talk about the pig and the dog and the demon. And then on this side, you can see the sheikh or the sage. Um, and we'll see if we can get to that today. I mean, we have some time remaining. So there you go. So if you see, if, when, when you are balanced, you have these four entities here in one line. You've got sabr, patience, courage, wisdom, and justice. These are known as uh, Ummahat al Fadail, or, or what's known in Christian tradition as the cardinal virtues, the four cardinal virtues. You've got, you've got justice, you've got wisdom, you've got courage, and you've got patience. And these are the four, if you want to, if you want to, 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 if you want to evaluate a good leader, a true leader, these four are the things you look out for in them. So you look at Nabi Dawood, for example. Why was he given Khilafa? Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. Fahkum bayna nas bil haq. Fahkum hikmah to establish what? Adala, justice. Bil haq, with truth. And he says then, this is how you do the stars, the connection of the stars in the Quran, right? The ayat are placed as stars. So you do the connection now. You go to Surah Al-Asr. Because enjoyment of truth goes hand in hand with patience. You need to have patience and that's that temporal time. Don't expect compensation immediately. You need to have patience for the justice of Allah to be established based on his hikmah. And he's given you that space to reflect on yourself. That's that temporal balance. If it is inflated, the concupiscence leads to profligacy, physical. I would encourage you to do your study on this word. This word is a very interesting word. You will get... From this one word, you will get all these ideologies that are related to, to, to uh, the liberal mindset, the liberative mindset, all these things. All these now left wing, what they're calling left wing, right? Now the, the, you've got left wing and right wing. So you've got, you've got those who are free and secular. And then you've got conservative. Conservative is bad, according to them. Free and secular, that's good. Because they, they are profig profligates themselves. That's why they're spreading that ideology. And it is the ideology of Iblis. Right? In Surah Al-Kaf. Why, why? I've always asked why that ayah is in Surah Al-Kaf. Right in the in smack in the middle of Surah Al-Kaf. The same ayah repeated from Surah Al-Baqarah. But then the words are changed there. And he specifies it there. Kanamin al-Jin. He's from the jinn. He refused to, to, to prostrate. He's from the jinn. You see? 
that fisk there, that profligacy, that's a disease manifesting from the heart. And when it is depleted, the person is lethargic. It's just lazy. Sloth is, is one of the diseases. Oh, you've got the seven, seven deadly sins. In, in, in Christian tradition, you've got the seven deadly sins. Uh, pride, gluttony, envy, um, sloth. I'm spacing out. Somebody help me. But that's, that falls under envy. Uh, anger or wrath. And then uh, there's two more. Anyway, someone, whoever's there, can, they can, can maybe look it up and post it or something. I think there's someone who's posted in the chat. I'm spacing out. Um, sloth, you can open the books. Uh, did you mention greed? Greed, yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Greed. Those are the seven seven deadly sins. Sloth is one of those deadly sins. And, and, and if you look at people nowadays, oh man, you'll be surprised. You know, people are like sloths. <laughs> they're either incredibly hyperactive in their pursuit of dunya or they're completely depleted. They just want to relax, just lie down. You know, we talked about vacation last week. What does vacation really mean? It's to go and vacate yourself of the dunya we so you can fill yourself you know you've got you've got what's known as um uh you've got uh um, you see when the prophet went up into the mountain what was he doing there he was trying to empty himself he was vacating himself in preparation now, obviously he didn't know at that time but in preparation for what was to come he wanted to fill himself with something more than just the mundane affairs, uh, you know, the, the, the decadence of the Quraysh at the time, you see? But now people go on vacation and they want to sit back in, and sip whatever, whatever it is, the, the drinks that they sit on and enjoy the sun and, and have whatever. It's, it's, it's luxury for them. This is slothfulness, right? Um, and so if the, if the Ghadab now on this side, if it is overly inflated, you see, you keep coming out now. You're trying to, you're sorry, you think you're defending yourself, right? You're not defending the truth. I get all these people who keep sending me emails telling me, oh, you're this and you're that. Oh, you know, we have to defend the dean. You're not defending the dean. You're not, you're defending yourself because you lost the argument. A lot of these people who are, we have, if you have to defend the dean, you're not defending, you're defending yourself because you're arguing out over a point that you don't even know what the point is. You don't know how to argue. You don't know how to debate. You don't know how to reason. It is just coming out. It's just raw anger and wrath that is coming out. And it leads ultimately to defiance. You defy now the ultimate truth. You won't accept it. This is why Iblis was defiant. Abba was takbara. Abba was takbara. He, he defied the command of his Lord. You see, and because he was arrogant, arrogance prevents you from seeing the truth. So defiance now traces its root back to arrogance, which traces its root back to pride and envy. The disease is pride and envy. And then it manifests into the soul as arrogance, and then it comes out as defiance. And then when it is depleted now, that's where you get your insecurities. Your fear, you're afraid, you don't have the courage, you don't have your, your, you know, you're timid now in this case. Someone is, you know, giving it to you, but you, you, you can't take it. And this will affect you on the inward now. So an overinflation of any of these three will manifest externally. A depletion of, of any of these three will manifest internally. They will destroy you internally first, and then they will manifest externally. And the reverse is true. The overinflation of them will manifest externally first, and then the, the fallback will be internal. Do you understand what I'm saying? You guys understand that? If, if whatever is inflamed will manifest externally first, the damage will be external, the fallback will be internal. Whatever is depleted, the manifestation will be internal first, and then the fallback will be external. So if your ghadab is depleted, you lose the passion and the zeal. Internally, you fall into a state of depression or insecurity or anxiety. And then you don't have the drive to do what you need to do in your affairs of deen or of dunya. 
And with the intellect now, an overinflation is going to be things like deceit, you know, plotting and planning, strategizing, thinking about this, thinking about that. A lot of people go through this process of, of this thinking and they don't realize that, you see, because the, the, the mind works on logic and it delights in these things, the intellect. Uh, no, no. The, the, the intellect works on these things and it delights on these things. This is why people, they, they really enjoy um, politics. No, no, it's fine. This is why they really like policy. I'm just pulling up a reference. I had written something down earlier. Yeah, you see the deceit, because that's the realm of politics, right? It's lying and backstabbing and this way and that way. The manipulation of truth, manipulation of facts. You see, lying and cheating is not a is not a lack of intelligence. It's actually highly 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 activated intelligence, because to construct a lie, you have to really think out what the truth is first of all in order to twist it. So these are people. So you'll find people who are. They're very well balanced in terms of maybe their khadab or the shahwa, right? They, they, they don't show like they're miserly or they're greedy or any such thing. But they'll be sitting there and plotting and planning and thinking about this, thinking about that, politics here, politics there, whether it's general politics, family politics, workplace, but they love all these things because the mind delights in it. And the problem with that is because the mind works on logic. Whereas an axiom, we say that logic can be sound, but not necessarily true. So you can build the logic and it makes sense to them internally, but it doesn't lead them to the truth because it is based on a false assumption. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah, his refutation on logic, I mean, I don't agree with the whole thing and many ulama don't really favor his refutation per se because he ended up throwing up the, the baby with the bathwater. But he makes some very, very, perfectly logical points in that refutation of logic because he argues that the logic is built prior to it being constructed. It is, it is preceded by a, an assumption, a, a presumption, a speculation, which may or may not be true and so cannot be relied upon because if the starting point is wrong, the, the equation can be correct but the conclusion will be wrong or its interpretation will be wrong, right? And this is why these people will sit and they will think about things and because they are unable to arrive at the truth, it, it doesn't resolve itself internally because the fitra opposes it. See, the fitra recognizes the balance. The fitra recognizes the ilm, the true understanding. The fitra recognizes the tawheed and the proper governance. And so while the intellect is working on this level, trying to resolve something, the fitra is opposing that. The fitra is telling the individual, something is not right here. Yeah, the logic makes sense, but then it just doesn't fit. You can't come to a resolution about it. And so such people will often continually try to bring this subject up again, whether with themselves internally or in discussion with others, they'll keep bringing it up. I don't understand. Why did they do this? I don't understand. What does it, you see, they'll keep doing this to bring that subject or that topic back into discussion every time they get an opportunity. Why? Because it's not being, they're not able to resolve it internally. And it will also manifest in their dreams because one of the things about the dreams of the self is that the self is attempting to heal itself. When the intellect has got an unresolved issue, the self tries to heal it if it was not able to resolve it during the wakeful state. We'll come to that section, inshallah. And, and this is why you find example in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in Surah Al-Muddathir, Innahu fakara wa qaddara. You see, he thought, and then he deliberated, and then, you know, he figured it out this way, and then he destroyed himself. See how he destroyed himself. And he continued to destroy himself, because he keeps bringing up the same thing again. You keep bringing it up again and again, and for what reason? In, 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 in a majority of cases, that thing does not even concern you. 
It doesn't concern you. This is why the Prophet said, Min husni islamil mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'nihi. Don't concern yourself with things that do not concern you. If from your beauty to from 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 the beauty of your submission to your Lord is to leave what does not concern you. But people will pick things that don't concern them, or they have begun with the wrong assumption, a misconception, a misunderstanding, and they are not able to resolve it. Instead of trying to go back and admit fault that I picked the wrong thing, I shouldn't have gotten involved, or I didn't understand. You see, you have a conflict with somebody. Instead of resolving it with that person, to say, you know, you say this and this. Could you, you know, clarify it because I didn't understand what you said or something. You know, I felt bad. I felt hurt with what you said. Is that what you meant? Instead of doing that, you're sitting here and activating your intellect in its deliberations. So what happens then? You, you just keep on destroying yourself. This is why he says, There's the, This is the disease in the heart. Allah lets it prolong because he is not going to intervene and rectify your disease for you. He is not going to change the condition of a people until they change their own condition. And if you don't make an effort to change your own condition, the disease prolongs. But here's the thing. They will turn back around and say, and, 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 and reconsider. Then, then he's going to observe again and look and think it out again. Could it be? Maybe it's because of something I say. Is it possible? Now, this can fall one of two ways. Either he will take the right path or he'll falter back. If his heart is diseased, he will falter back. or He'll frown and then he scowls and say, mm -mm, no, I don't think so. It's not me, it's that other person. Arrogance is going to manifest. Arrogance will manifest. He will turn away from that and he's going to become no, no. Me? Envy of him? Subhanallah. Audhu billah. I know. Because people will sooner admit to murder than admit to a disease in themselves. Something wrong with me? No, no, no. It's him. He did like that. She said like this. She did like that. <laughs> So you continue destroying yourself. This is your intellect going on and on and on, and you don't even know where you've arrived at. This is why it is equatable to the demon. This is a demonic quality. These are where the shayateen come from, minal, 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 minal ins, from humankind. When it is depleted, then you have jal. You have ignorance. Because you're heedless, you don't know, and you don't know that you don't know. You are ignorant of your own ignorance. That's the worst category you can be under because you're not using the, the aql, you're not using the intellect. The, the intellect is al misbah, it's the lamp which is within you. If you don't ignite the lamp, you will be sitting in darkness. You'll be sitting in the darkness of ignorance. If all these are manifested in terms of their balance, then you will be considered the wise sage, the sheikh, because you will establish sound governance within you, adala, and that will be reflected externally. You can you can stop sharing that. How much time? One hour. Okay, so we yeah, are we'll we'll stop here then because the next section. I can combine the next two sections together. It's going to um, the heart, the state of the heart amidst its army. Let's uh, escape. Um, click on the screen. Yeah, and then press escape. Actually, we can finish this section, inshallah. It's not. Yes, those, yeah, those are the seven, seven sins, seven deadly sins, which is interesting because in um, 
in 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 Christian demonology, um, each of those is a prince of hell. Um, I mean, it's just the terminology that's different, but there's there's an associated demon to each of those manifestations. So, likewise, any individual human being who uh, who manifests this internally to become a shaitani individual will be of the likeness of the demonic quality of lust, gluttony, or greed, pride, envy, anger, wrath. Uh, uh, anger and wrath is the same, and uh, and sloth. So yeah, we can do the next section really quickly, inshallah. So faslu ahwal al qalb asakiruhu. He says then, "Eilam anna lil qalb ma asakiruhu ahwal ahwal wasifat." So the heart, amidst its dominion and its armies, now has got states and then has got qualities. So the heart is qallaba yuqallibu. It keeps turning. So it has states. Everyone is in a different state. It keeps on turning. And then it also has qualities. Ba'aduha yusama akhlaq al-su wa ba'aduha akhlaq al-hasan. So some of these are virtuous qualities, as, uh, are qualities of vice, and then others are qualities of virtue. We'll discuss those later in the section of, of vice and virtue. Okay, it's coming up next anyway. فَبِأَخْلَاقِ الْحَسَنَةِ يَبْلُغُ دَرَجَةُ السَّعَادَةِ وَبِالْأَخْلَاقِ السَّيِّئَةِ هَلَاكُهُ وَخُرُوجُهُ لِلشَّقَاءِ so the by the characters of virtue, it will arrive at degrees of felicity and contentment. And then through the qualities or the uh, characteristics of vice, it will be destroyed and then expelled into damnation. And these are these originate from four uh, genuses, from, 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 from four comprehensive categories. Akhlaq al-shayateen, akhlaq al-bahaim, akhlaq al-sibaa, akhlaq al-malaika. From the uh, qualities of the demons, the qualities of the beasts, and the, the characteristics of the predators, and the qualities and characteristics of the angels. فَأَعْمَالُ السُّؤْ مِنَ الْأَكْلِ وَالشَّرْبُ وَالنَّوْمُ النِّكَعَ هِيَ أَخْلَاقُ الْبَحَائِمِ So the blameworthy qualities, the foul actions, these are from copulation and libation, um, sleep. Libation means like to, to drink too much, over drinking. And that's not just like alcohol, anything, like you just, you keep drinking it, you know. Nowadays they give you these, you know, huge, huge glasses or people want like an extra large latte and I don't know with what inside it and that that's what it means that's just overdoing it now you know pumping pumpkin spice with two splashes of vanilla and remove the flaw and all that stuff going on with the frappuccino cappuccino and all that you know. And likewise, from the qualities of the uh, that are yani the aggressive actions, yeah, uh, these are like hmm, violence, you know, conflict, killing, murdering, fighting, argumentation, debate. These are all predatory qualities. And likewise, the actions that are nafsiya, volitions of the self, or yeah, selfish actions, these are things like de deception and ruse and cheating, sabotaging, plotting and planning, and these are demonic qualities. So actions that are related to copulation and eating and drinking and all these things, these are bestial qualities. Actions that are related to debating and arguing and fighting and conflicting and all these things, these are predatory qualities. And then actions of the self now, because it's the self that becomes demonic. The self can become angelic, praiseworthy, or demonic, blameworthy. In its plotting and plotting and strategizing and these kind of things, these are from the qualities of the demons. Now, for the intellective actions things that the intellect does it's very interesting he's talking about these three things because if you look in surah al-kaf and he, when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his abd 
he mentions first rahma and then he says alm we gave him from us rahma and then we gave him from us ilm and then when the when the when the companions of the cave when they are seeking assistance from allah they first ask for his rahma and then they ask for his guidance and these are the qualities of intellection it's not just book knowledge like you have a phd so now i know everything there is to know about everything because without rahma that knowledge cannot be executed with true wisdom and without khair that knowledge cannot be executed with any purpose because the knowledge to be executed it has to manifest righteousness it has to do good here akhlaq al malaika these are angelic qualities then he says faslu fi faslu al akhlaq al hasana wa akhlaq al qabiha on the on the qualities of virtue and the qualities of vice wa'lam anna fi jild ibn adam arba'at ashya from the very from the very uh, shell of the of the son of adam there are four things al kalb wal khinzir wal shaitan wal malak there is the dog there is the pig and then there is the demon and then there is the angel so your soul will manifest into one of these four which is what is known as like now the dog soul the the pig soul the demonic soul or the angelic soul because the dog soul this is what the dog continuously does he barks he just blah, 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 blah. he doesn't know why he's doing it you see and the pig is just consuming you see so the dog soul is your hadam and the pig soul is your shahwa and the demonic soul and the angelic soul wal kalbu madhmum fi sifatihi wa laysa bi madhmum fi suratihi the dog is blameworthy in his quality not in its creation it's the quality that's blameworthy the creation is a beautiful creation you see the same thing goes for our, for 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 al ard when the angel said ataj'alu fiha may yufsidu fiha wa yasfiku dima uh they they're not referring to the, the 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 creation itself because the the earthly realm is a beautiful creation you look at all the all the all the beauty and majesty that allah has created the stars the planet mountains the trees everything but it is blameworthy in its quality because this is the nature of um the earthly domain likewise the, the dog is not blameworthy in its creation it's blameworthy in its quality that quality which is a reactive quality see as soon as the dog senses something in its vicinity it immediately gets you know tense and active and up and it's ready to attack that's the hadam now wa kadhalika shaitan wa kadhalika shaitan wa malaika dhammuhum wa madhuhum fi sifatihim wa laysa dhalika fi surihim wa khalqihi wa khalqihi wa khalqihi and likewise the shaitan and the malaika they are not blameworthy and praiseworthy in their create in their uh, in in their uh, in their forms in their created forms rather they are blameworthy in their in their qualities وكذلك الخنزير مذموم في صفاته وليس بمذموم في خلق في خلقته and likewise for the pig is not blameworthy in its created form because it is a creation of Allah it is blameworthy in its attributes in its qualities in the things that it does is one of the reasons why the ulama when they were looking for uh, ways to expand on the understanding of the prohibition of consumption of the pig is because of its qualities the way it consumes is equally harmful when its flesh is consumed and this is one of the arguments from reformed judaism in part of this whole dajjalic agenda of establishing the law the, the renewed law of the torah in the land of israel by which their king the messiah is going to rule the false messiah is going to rule by but obviously they don't like the 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 the, the old testament themselves they don't like the testament that was given to them by moses through through moses by allah they don't want that so they reform it and one of the prohibitions that is expanded from that is the consumption of the pig 
It's always been a prohibition in, in, in all of humanity from the very beginning. Because, and this is why the ulama tried to understand to derive a reasoning from it. But part of reform Judaism is to now look and see and see, whoa, you, well, you see, it was prohibited because, you know, the pig was impure and because of what it was being fed. Now you've got all the scientific advancements and you can, you can uh, improve the feed that they give to the pig and uh, the living conditions and make them sanitary and all these things. So now they've started justifying the consumption of the pig in, in, their, in their manipulated sharia. وقد أمر ابن آدم بأن يكشف ظلم ظلم الجهل بنور العقل خوفا من الفتنة. And the son of Adam was commanded to expose the darkness of ignorance using the light of the intellects, out of fear of the trial and the tribulation. To 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 get out of the trial. To rectify it, there are two things. Either you are in the trial or you foresee it. And you foresee it and you evade it. This is the higher intellect. The fourth category in Kitab al-Ilm, Imam al-Ghazali gives four categories. The highest is the intellect that is able to foresee an outcome. Most people cannot. That's why they get stuck in the fitna. What do you do in either case is you use the intellect the light of the intellect to eradicate the darkness in order to either evade or rectify the fitna or get out of the fitna. كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما من أحد إلا وله شيطان ولي شيطان وأن 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 الله قد أعانني على الشيطان حتى أسلم. Everyone has got a shaitan. I also have a shaitan. Allah has enabled me to overpower my shaitan and he has submitted. This is the Prophet Sallallahu saying, everyone has a demon. Everyone has demonic qualities. Even Aisha had a demon. You see, she got upset. She got jealous. The Prophet asked her, Ataki shaitanuki? Ya Aisha, Ataki shaitanuki? Did your demon come to you? <laughs> Is that why you're behaving like that? Is that why you're showing this? You're being jealous? <laughs> you see, everyone has that. وَكَذَلِكَ الشَّهْوَ وَالْغَدَبِ يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يَكُونَ تَحْتَ يَدَ الْعَقَلِ فَلَا يَفْعَلُ شَيْئًا إِلَّا بِأَمْرِهِ and thus it is, it is important, it is incumbent that the concupiscent and the irascible are kept under the control of the intellect so that they do not do anything except by the directive of the intellect. Because if they are allowed to do their own thing, then shaitan is going to manipulate it. Those whisperings that are coming to you primarily target those parts of your psyche, your psychology that are reactive. And these whispers are minal jinnati wannas. From mankind and from the jinn. It's not just the shaitan that we think, because when someone says shaitan, we think jinn. You see, somehow, I don't know what happened somewhere in our, in our mental powers, you see, our geniuses, we ended up equating the two, and then we forgot that there are shaitan among mankind as well. Because all these, these people, these are all shaitan. The Mark Zuckerberg and the Twitter guy, the new one, what's his name? Elon Musk, the one who just bought the Twitter. Uh, the, the, all these politicians, these leaders, all these meta motivational speakers, they come on TED Talk wearing shorts and giving lectures about their new discoveries. These are all shayateen. And they give you these whispers. And you take them and you drink them in. And they're not meant to improve your intellect. They are meant to prompt your reactive faculties. This is why you keep getting upset at things. This is why people start jumping up and down. It is important that you place your concupiscent. This is why it's important you place these two faculties under the control of the intellect. You arm yourself with knowledge and you execute that knowledge with hikmah in order to maintain and regulate these two because it's not about them outside there. It's not about this one and that one and the other one. It's about you. You see, you're not going to be held accountable for what they do. 
you're going to be held accountable for what you do. Yoma la tamliku nafsun li nafsin shay'a. That day when you're going to be resurrected, you're, no soul is going to come to the assistance of any other soul. It's you alone who is accountable. So you need to focus here. You need to be selfish in that regard and, and, and work towards rectifying yourself. If he does this, if you do that, it, this is going to manifest within you virtuous qualities. And these are the qualities of or characteristics of the, of the angels. This is the seed of felicity. But if you differ against that, and then you end up having your intellect serve your shahwa and your ghadab. You're going to manifest qualities that are vile. You know, vice is going to manifest in you, not virtue. Because that's what the shayateen then manifest. It's the shahwa and the ghadab. This is what they're going to prompt the demons now. Min al jinnati wal nas will prompt this in you in order to prompt this reaction out of you. And so that your concupiscence and your ghadab override your intellect. And then what manifests after that, you become like them. And this is their agenda, worldwide agenda is to do what? To make everyone like them. They have a certain ideology, they want to turn you into them. If you want the hierarchy behind that, it goes all the way to the mastermind himself, to the Dajjal. And who is the Dajjal? What is he? other than a, 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 a husk that only exhibits the nature of the world, yes, because he's only a material being. He doesn't have an essence. He's a jessel. And a jessel is a lifeless body. It doesn't have a spirit. It doesn't have intellection. All it manifests is what the beasts and the predators manifest in this world. And he wants to make everyone like him. So the ideology will transcend that ladder and through all the channels that are in place, to make you like them. And this is my, my, my what, I, what I, you know, got upset about last week, about the, you know, putting your child in front of the device. You're turning your child into them as well. So it's not only you who is there, even your children are doing that. And if that's the upbringing you're giving your children, they'll do the same thing to their children. And then the cycle goes on. And these are the qualities of the demons. And this is the seed of, dam of damnation. Uh, it will then become distinguished to him in his sleep. He will see himself submitting to the form of a pig or a dog. We'll talk about this in dreams later on, and I'll explain this better. وَكَانَ مِنُهُ كَمَثَلِ رَجُلٍ مُسْلِمٍ يَأْخُذُ رِجْلًا مُسْلِمِينَ يَحْبِسُهُمْ عِنْدَ كَافِرِينَ It's like the man who himself is a Muslim. He takes his own fellow Muslim and then betrays him to the kafirin. So you've, you've taken your own self and betrayed yourself to the demons. What's your state going to be on Yawm al Qiyamah? When you take your intellect and put your intellect under the control, betray your intellect to the control of the Shahwa and the Ghadab, and these two are a pig and a dog. You've taken something that is of an angelic nature and, 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 sub, and betrayed it to, to the dog and the pig. What's your state going to be? What sort of a ruler are you going to be? What sort of a khalifa are you going to be on that day? Let's stop here in Shavu. We will continue next week on the following section, which says on whether form, the form follows the meaning. Hal asuwar, hal asuwaru lil maani. Does the form for this will be an interesting section because now will be he's going to sort of 
give you a segue into how the intellect works. And, uh, and then we will come to, uh, now, yeah, inshallah, inshallah. We'll continue on this next one, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Let's take a quick break, five minutes, and we'll meet again for questions and answers. Please keep your questions uh, short and brief because I crossed over our time marker today. So I don't want to end up having to extend uh, question and answers. So grab your questions in advance. If you if you want, you can just write them down in the chat box. They'll be read out to me. Um, but if you have any questions, please make them really brief, as brief as you possibly can. And inshallah, I'll try and be brief in my answers as well. Jazakumullah khairan. See you in a bit. But now, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Inshallah, now I'm going to present. But yeah, it's on. It's good. Now, anyone questions? Uh, discussion? Although not discussion, maybe today because we have limited time. Funny quote from today's class where in short lecture. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw I, I I watched the I watched the TED talk, the guy came on and he's wearing a t-shirt and shorts, and I was just amused by that. And he had a, he had a PhD in linguistics, and I was just amazed that uh, you know you <laughs> how you come on stage wearing something like that, giving a talk on linguistics. I mean it's clear evidence that you don't really understand language because your external language is is just as shabby as your internal language because if your internal language was sound you would at least manifest it with dressing in a decent manner when you're coming out in front of people <laughs> um, anyway um there's no one. Everyone is quiet today. Why is everyone? Send a reference to the shameless. Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that me, myself, and my cheapness the same thing. My yeah, you could say that it means yeah, cheapness is sort of a a colloquial meaning. Or a, or a term used in colloquial language for miserliness. Miserliness is an older term. What's well, me, myself, and yeah. selfishness? So, yeah, me, myself, and I is selfishness now. So today's channel is all me, myself, and I. Exactly. Exactly. Ana wa me, myself, me and myself. Then that's why they can't claim spouse. Well, yeah, exactly, because everyone wants to have a like a like a criterion before they want to get into a relationship. And so it's all about or does the other person meet my criteria first? That's me myself. And it's uh, I, it's a very interesting like uh, segment of a lecture Sheikh Hamza gave regards. He talked about the iPod, you know, the iPad, and he said it's the generation of the I. You know, it's all about I and and me. <laughs> and this is because it's it's now manifested in the in the youth now. So everyone feels like they're entitled, you know. I'm entitled to the truth. I'm entitled to be given some, you know. I it's it's like an age of entitlement for people because it's all just this it's nafsi now, it's all selfish. And so you find people hoard. I mean, you could see how people behave during the whole uh, when the when the, you know the lockdown started. And people going and just hoarding things like toilet paper and the most insignificant of things you could possibly think of because everyone was thinking about themselves each person was thinking about myself and so now why is everyone quiet today i'm surprised yes go ahead Someone's someone hand is up on the chat. Yes. Are you your problem? Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So this is page 21 
of the handout. Mm -hmm. So it says, um, if it is mediated, it will lead, lead to chastity and moderation. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uh, mediation is this? You said, uh, is it the intellection by the heart? And if it is the intellection uh, by the heart, is it spiritual? Because like you said, logic uh, may be sound but false. So, uh, and also um, you told us about ilm. So what kind of ilm is this? The religious knowledge that will be able to um, mediate? Okay, so, so your shahwa and hada are always attempting to to function, right? Your 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 internal faculties they don't they're not they're not they were never non-active. They are always active. Uh, we think that when we go to sleep, you know, our mind is blank and you know nothing functions, and but it's not. It's active. Your shahwa is always active. Your aql is always active. Your khadab is always active. Your, and your whole being, because you're alive. So long as you're alive, you're active. You're just in a different state of existence. You're in a state of sleep. So because it's always these things are always active, they're always being prompted by external stimuli or internal stimuli. Uh, and, and if neither of those arise, then they will do their own thing. So this tends to create conflict sometimes within you. Because... Let's say you're fasting and then your shahwa is, is overly active and it's too strong and you know, the desire to food and it sort of puts you in a state. This is why you find people get angry then. Because typically when the shahwa doesn't get what it wants, it will, it will employ its neighbor. It will call upon the, the, the ghadab to help it out. This is why you find children, for example, they I want, I want, I want, and, 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 and there, is a, there is a prohibition on that from the parent. No, no, no. And then so the child starts throwing a tantrum now. So the first input, that's the shahwa. That's the concupiscence I want. And then because it didn't get it, the shahwa was not satisfied. It employed the use of the ghadab. That's where you're getting the, temp, the tantrum for, from. And it's the same situation so far as like governance is concerned. When the politicians want their own thing and then they don't get it, then what do they do? They start inciting the public or they'll pull their connections with the police force and start getting you know, them involved. And so this is now an internal conflict. This conflict now has to be mediated in order to bring the inflation back to a balance. So the mediation now has to take place with the head of state, the king, the sultan, and the grand vizier, because as far as the sultan is concerned, the vizier is in charge of them, so he's accountable. So the mediation now has to take place between these three, whether it is... It is, uh, uh, or, or all the components that are involved in that. The way the mediation will take place is that the heart is the one that may, has to make the final decision to say, do I compromise or do I punish? Do I let it go or do I punish? The intellect has to present his case, why it was re refused. The shahwa wanted, why did the intellect refuse? Because that's the conflict, right? For the intellect to present a sound case to the heart, he has to have logic, he has to have reason, he has to build his argument sound. It means this is the conversation that is taking place within you now. What's the rational argument behind it? And what's the selfish argument? And who wins in this case? If the intellect does not have a sound argument, he will lose the case in court. And this is how you see many of the cases that go to court, you know, criminals, they'll get off. On, 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 on almost no charges sometimes or reduced charges. Why? Because they have a very good lawyer and that lawyer presents a better argument than the, than the prosecutor's argument or something of the sort. So the intellect needs a sound argument. If the intellect doesn't have a sound argument, that's sound and true, not just sound. It has to be sound and true argument. Then it will win the case with the heart and the shahwa will have to accept fault. The heart will make the decision at that point and say, no, you are at fault so that the balance can be restored. If the intellect does not have a proper argument that's sound and true, then the shahwa will win in his own uh, arguments. And the heart is weak in this case because the heart has to make a sound judgment. And the intellect's argument is weak. Therefore, the shahwa's argument wins over or the ghadab's argument wins over. Now, if the shahwa wins or the ghadab wins, 
the imbalance is still there. The conflict may be re resolved, but there's still an imbalance. This will manifest in a disease in the heart because the king has been crippled now. So how does the intellect build a sound argument and a true argument? It has to be from knowledge. There's no other avenue. It has to be from knowledge. And this is now the epistemology. You remember we said in the very beginning, a psychological disorder is at its very root an epistemological crisis. Is because there's no sound epistemology internally. Meaning what? The source of knowledge has got doubts in it. The foundation. And the coherence of truth has got doubts in it. So there has to be a source of knowledge that has no doubt in it. La rayba fi. You see, this is why the, the Quran begins with that statement. Thalik al kitab la rayba fi. There is no doubt in it because it is it is absolute in its truth. If you derive the knowledge from there, then the intellect will be empowered. Any argument that is brought forth against the intellect in this case, whether internally or from external agents now, the heart would be sound because it can rely on that knowledge. You see, the heart needs something to cling to, something that is absolute, something that is true, not something that will betray it. And so the heart will be able to rely on that knowledge because that's one of its two prime qualities, to know and to believe. I hope that answered the answered your question. Right, uh, one more question, please. This is page twenty-three. Mm -hmm. uh, for the out of uh, fear of trial and tribulation. So, is this the um, heart? Is this kind of a pre preparation for uh, battle, or pre preparation for the trials and tribulations that are going to come? So if one intellects properly and exposes the darkness, so is this the darkness of the self, the characteristic, the wild characteristics of the self uh, of ignorance with the light of the intellect and uh -huh. out of so, your soul? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the fitna is not just the fitna, but any fitna. It's just that we are in an age now where we are actually encountering the fitna of the, of the end. But fitna has always existed in the world. So prior people had their own capacity to deal with fitna at their ages. But now we are actually in a state whereby we are encountering a different kind of fitna, a much more pronounced fitna, an exponentially aggravated fitna. And it is all the more incumbent and important to prepare ourselves for that. Now, what's interesting about this is, again, you have to go back to the four concepts that I talked about. You see, Tawheed, that's the primary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regulates everything. He's the one who resolves it. So if he's allowed a fitna to take place, then with the tawazun, which is the balance of it, he has equally placed the, uh, the, the weapons that you would use to counter that fitna. So as much fitna there is, there is also a facilitation that you need, that is available to you to counter that. So in the past, to seek out knowledge to resolve the fitna was a much more difficult affair, right? You'd have to travel a long distance. Some people, all they knew was just Surah Al-Ikhlas because that was as far as they could go in terms of gaining knowledge. And they, and they dealt with the fitna of their time. It was in, it was in uh, you know, it was uh, balanced out, equal, equal to equal. This is the external, this is the external fitna? This, this is now the external fitna that is happening. Now, we are in an age of the Dajjal, which means fitna is much more pronounced. But likewise, if you think about it, the balance is always restored. So it's also easier to acquire knowledge. I mean, think about what we're talking right now, right? This whole technology and all that. It's got its fitna, but it's also facilitating an exchange of knowledge, right? So it, it sort of balances out itself in that way. But it, it's upon you to make the effort to seek out the knowledge and use it as a light to ward of the fitna. Now, and so far as the light is concerned, this is the light of the intellect needs to be ignited internally to ward off the darkness of ignorance. And these are used in, in analogy. 
So light is used as an analogy for knowledge because knowledge makes known what was unknown in the same way that light reveals what cannot be seen. Okay, and then darkness is equated to ignorance because when, when you're ignorant, you can't see. You can't see spiritually because you're ignorant about something. You don't know it. You see? So that's the, the lamp of the intellect is supposed to be ignited to start warding off that light, the, that darkness. We'll come to Surah to Noor, Ayah to Noor, and you'll understand the lamp of the intellect better, inshallah. The shorts and the lecture, was that a reference to shameless? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I already answered that. Huh? I already answered that. Can you comment on coffee and tawakkul? Coffee and tawakkul? That's what it's written, coffee and tawakkul. It came up a couple of times. I am not sure what that, that means. Coffee and tawakkul? It's better See, to... You were talking about uh, um, ordering a, you know, a large latte with all the... Uh, okay. I think that's what it's referring to, maybe. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> no, I just, I, I just say that as a joke, you know, like if, you, if you've lived in the West, you could see this kind of extravagance in the West a lot. The, you know, the, the fancy, fancy drinks and all that. You yeah, find people. Trying to say you're, yeah. Small is satisfaction. Exactly. You need yeah, you don't need that excess. You don't need a, a whole liter of coffee yeah. when, you know, the small is enough for you. You know, you don't need a full liter of Coke when. I mean, you shouldn't drink Coke anyway, <laughs> but you don't need that, the whole jug of it, when that glass is enough for you. That's the extravagance of it. So, I mean, I was using that as just a, because I've seen this a lot in the in the West, you know, people will stand in line and, you know, can give me a large frappuccino with the pumpkin spice and all that stuff in there. Like, I'm standing there wondering, why do you need that? It costs 10 bucks. <laughs> right, it costs, costs you know, uh, 10, 15 dollars. And here's the interesting thing. They'll finish that. They'll take that plastic cup and throw it in the bin. You know, one of, one of, my, one of my teachers, when he, when he went to the U.S., and he told me this later on, he went to the U.S. and he saw people doing that. And it, it really hurt him to see them do that. He said, they just drink and then they just throw it away. Like, you know, at the water, the, the, the water thing, the dispenser, the machine, you know, they have those plastic cups. You just pull it out, you drink, and then you throw it away. Then it comes back, the same person will come back around and take another one, drink, and then throw it away. Like he just felt that that's like this is a sign of a diseased society that people would just do that. Like not any having any thought of how much they're you know wasting. Like, what's the need for that? Can't you, you know, have your own cup or something, bring it with you? Um, it's better to not rely on something material and try to engage your intellect. To be yes, definitely. Because remember, we say that matter is relative, right? Material is always changing. So any reliance on, on that which is changing or subject to change will betray the heart because the heart wants something absolute. So any reliance on a material entity, people do actually get very attached to their things. They get attached to their phone or their laptop or something. And then we all, and you should see some people when the phone gets displaced, it's like they're a different person altogether. Like they've been possessed. Like, what happened to my phone? Where's my phone? Has anyone seen my phone? Can you ring my phone? You know? <laughs> like they just completely lose it. They're so attached to the material thing that when it's when it's momentarily gone or it's damaged or it's changed or transformed or anything, you know, the heart becomes completely turbulent. They become a different person entirely. Last week you described the model for memory processes. Do you have an illustration prepared for that model? Oh, the, 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 the memory process is no, I'm I, sorry, I did not. Good. I end up having too much to do sometimes and I'm not able to, I'm, I don't have a chart prepared for that, but uh, who asked this question? Safe. safe? Okay, Safe, if you can please um, send me a message later on as a reminder. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll prepare something at least. Um, for that, what we what we talked about in last week's session, the different kinds of memories and the different components that uh, that are used in memory, Shawa. Sure, no problem. Is is there anyone else in the in the chat? 
you know, I, I didn't, when I said, keep your questions, I didn't mean don't ask any questions. I just meant like shorten. <laughs> so, um, any, any, anyone else who has any questions or discussion on that? Would you agree that guilt usually comes from a good place internally? Uh, subjectively, yes and no. Yes and no. Guilt is part of the kind of soul that is an um, nafs It is the condemning soul. So, I mean, all these things are there have been assembled in you, as uh, as Azali said in uh, in an earlier section. All these things the qualities, the, the good, the bad, the vice, the virtue, they've all been assembled in you for the sake of your, or facilitating your journey through this life. So even something like greed, uh, sorry, not greed, uh, guilt is, is a good thing and it can also be a bad thing. Like someone can be consumed by guilt. You know, they feel so horrible. Like you could be Someone can be abusive to another person all their life and then they pass away and, you know, you lost the opportunity to, to rectify or resolve or, 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 you know, seek out forgiveness or something like that. That guilt will consume you. Um, so it can become a bad thing. But in itself is not a bad thing. And by the way, this is now a, a more deeper philosophical discussion on the concept of good and evil. Um, Good and evil are subjective inherently. They're not objective things. They're not objects. They're not things, right? They're subjective. And this is why when you look at something that Allah has prohibited, it, the, the thing itself is not the bad thing. Like alcohol is, it itself is not a bad thing. It's the prohibition is on you consuming it. But so the evil is what manifests from the action of consuming it. Why? Because there's a prohibition on you from consuming it, right? Healing itself has got its place. So a lion can kill a gazelle, you know, mercilessly. You don't take the lion to court, right? It's not held, it's not held accountable for that. But if a man kills another man or even kills another animal mercilessly, then that's a crime. It is, it is a crime. Um, even in Islam, it's a crime, by the way. People don't think about that. They think it's only about killing man to man, but even killing animals, mercy, like the, the animals complained. The, 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 these are mutawatir hadith. The, the donkey complained to the Prophet وسلم, about the, the overburdening of the, its master was putting on it. And the Prophet told him not, the, told the master not to do that. So justice was given on behalf of, of the animal, not on behalf of the human being. You know, the, the gazelle would complain that, that they were being hunted out of season and, and its young ones were being killed. You know, so um, the, the act of killing, it's a subjective thing. So the prohibition is on, on the human being. That's why it becomes an evil act when it is committed. So something like guilt in this case is in what it is. It's, it's just there. It's there as a concept in what it it is manifested in will either cause you harm or benefit how you use it how you relate with it because some people will negate the guilt altogether they won't they won't think about the guilt even though it's there in defense of the self but guess what's that doing to the person internally it's ruining them it's manifesting as a disease or other people will you know they'll let the guilt consume them instead of trying to rectify it in one way or another so in the example that I gave, the person passed away, you couldn't ask for forgiveness. There are other things that you can do out of the sincerity of a heart. You know, you could build a masjid in their name if you're able to, if you have the means. As Sadaqa Jariya, you can do that. You know, you can, you can feed uh, the hungry and the needy. There are other things that you can do, like somebody who is trained in spiritual psychology. Like this, what we're doing, someone like Ghazali, for example, or Ibn Sina, for example, in this case, who, who is able to give you a psychological resolution, sorry, a spiritual resolution to the psychological problem, will tell you, you know, okay, so this is the issue you're having, do such and such an act, sincerely. Like the person who was told, go and give sadaqah, and it rectified his miserliness, right? Now. Or is the shell in the shell of Adam, are these built in us, or is it the physical body? 
Oh, di ada jild. Walam anna fi jild ibn Adam arba asya. The the jild is like the very um, the you could say like the fabric. Or, or, or the DNA of the human being, the very, the very, you know, fundamental structure of the human being. I mean, I'm using loose terms over here, but you could say the very essence of the human being, the man of the. So it's referring, it's referring to the to the physical body, in 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 the finest particulate of the physical body. In other words, all these qualities that he's talking about. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ فِي جِلْدِ ابْنِ آدَمَ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْيَاءَ الْكَلْبَ الْخِنْزِيرَ الشَّيْطَانَ الْمَلَكِ the, all these are there in you. They are built into you. And so whichever you manifest will, will change the form. So the next section, inshallah, will actually elaborate this further because he argues about whether the form follows the meaning or the meaning follows the form. And in conclusion, he says that if you are going to take on the form of the pig, then you will be resurrected as such. In other words, whatever meaning you inhibit within you, that's the form you're, you're eventually going to take on. So that's in your shell within you, these qualities are there. Whichever one you inhibit, that's ultimately what your becoming is going to be. See, so you're in a state of becoming. Kun, be, you came into existence. Fayakun, now become. So now you're in a state of becoming. Right? And you're still, the process is not done. It's not complete yet. So long as you're alive, so long as you're breathing, you're still in a state of becoming. This is why even at the very last moment, you can switch. You could commit the acts. You find this hadith in Imam Nawawi's collection, al you could You could find the individual at the very cusp of his final breath. He's about to enter paradise. And then he does the action of those who are of the occupants of hellfire and ends up joining them. Or at the very cusp of his last breath, he's about to enter the hellfire and he does the action or the deed of those of the people of paradise and he goes in and joins them. So you're still in the process of becoming. The journey is not over yet. So whatever you manifest during this journey, the destination, that's what you're going to inhibit. So the qualities are already in you. It's upon you to decide what you want to be. Or who you want to become? Do you want to become bestial, predatory, demonic, or angelic? Huh. Reminds me of the people who broke the Sabbath. Their forms were changed to apes. Yeah, because they wanted to be like apes, exactly. right? So the command came by, came down from the from Allah. You know, just be like apes that are despised. Right. So whatever you so if you're going to want to be like, I mean, these are the things that the modern world wants to justify in terms of their arguments of LGBTQ and gay relationships and all that, because their fundamental argument relies on the evolutionary process or we've come from apes. So according to them, that's in our nature. So it's nothing wrong because the apes are doing it. And by the way, the argument itself is fallacious because apes don't do that. Really, apes don't do that. In fact, they are, they, the ape in this case is the lowest because it's, this is why the Quran is using this as the lowest degradation. It's not the, it's not the highest, you know, even in terms of intellection. 90% 90, 90 of DNA might be shared, but not in terms of intellection. So if you look at the ape, like the chimpanzee, um, the chimpanzee only has about seven phonemes. Like they can only make about seven different sounds. You know, a phoneme like a, b, k, d, right? Ra, z, sh, z. These are all phonemes. The apes can only generate about seven phonemes. Birds are higher in intellection than apes. Birds are actually smarter than, than apes, which is very surprising <laughs> because birds have about 17 or 18 different phonemes. They can make 17 or 18, I'm not sure, different kinds of sounds. The human being can produce about a hundred different kinds of sounds. So realistically, we are more similar to birds than we are to apes in, in, in terms of our intellection. So the ape is actually lowest in grade. So their argument that, you know, because the apes do it, so we should also do it, you know, that just speaks to their stupidity. Because again, like the Quran says, be like apes then. What's the difference between you and them? <laughs> And any other question, anyone else? 
I've been given the the time marker. So if um, if there's nothing else, we can end for tonight, inshallah. All right, let's end for tonight then. Subhanaka wa bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, an astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana taqabbal minna, innaka anta samiyun alim, wa tuba alayna ya maulana, innaka anta tawabu rahim. Birahmatika ya arhamar rahimin, barakallahu fikum, wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullahu khairan, and inshallah, I'll see everyone next week. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.